This will be a, a long and complicated speech, so if anyone wants a bathroom pass, ask now. <laughs> I think you're all very special people, and I, I feel honored to be here tonight at, at your sixth annual convention. If there's anywhere in this country that leadership for the changes that we need in schooling will come, I think it will come from the people who are doing what you're doing. You're the 16th state that I've seen homeschooling in firsthand, and I have not seen a bad job being done. Uh, my wife said to tell you that you don't have to agree with everything I'm going to say here, <laughs> as she doesn't either. <laughs> and she warned me not to tell any Puget Sound jokes, so I won't because I don't know any Puget Sound jokes. I can't tell you anything about homeschooling, obviously, that you don't already know. So my talk tonight will mainly be about the schooling you missed when you decided to homeschool. About those places, I know a great deal. Uh, I think a good purpose would be served first, however, by telling you a bit about myself and I have an ulterior motive in this other than self-expression. I've worked as a New York City school teacher for 26 years, some of that time teaching the elite children from Manhattan's Upper West Side between Lincoln Center, where the opera is, and Columbia University, where the defense contracts are, and in recent years, teaching children from Harlem and Spanish Harlem whose lives are shaped by the dangerous undercurrents of the industrial city in decay. My present job is in the shadow of the largest Gothic cathedral in the United States, St. John the Divine, and not a very long walk from the famous Museum of Natural History and the equally famous Metropolitan Museum. I say those things because I know that a few of you daring souls have been to New York City and you probably stopped at those places and now you can locate me instead of a talking head as somebody who's between those two points. About three blocks from my school is the spot where the Central Park jogger was raped and brutally beaten a few years ago and seven of the nine attackers had gone to my school. Last night, last June, four people were murdered in or around my school building. Two of them I think you probably read about out here in Tacoma. Two students from a few doors away from where I taught saw a television show about kids who murdered their parents for insurance money and so these kids murdered their parents who didn't have any insurance money. Uh, I'm the union chapter chairman in the building and when I found out about that I went around to see how many teachers actually knew that the headline in the New York papers, and I'm sure in the national press, uh, had taken place in our building, and almost nobody did. That would give you some idea how fragmented the staff is in the building. However, as I was going around and asking how many people knew about those two murders, I heard about a third murder that had taken place on our playground a week earlier that I, I knew nothing about, and a fourth murder that had taken place in our after-school center three or four days earlier that I hadn't heard about either. And at that point, I, I stopped asking people because I had already knew what I needed to know. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, two of my kids, and if you want to see my class, they're hanging on posters back there on a curtain in, in the uh, exhibit room behind you. That's the class I'm teaching right now. Two of my kids were arrested for grand larceny. Actually, they were picked up having stolen $300 from a grocer in my school and they were released in the custody of the principal who put them right back into my class and they traveled uh, and still for that matter are, are traveling through the school. Uh, let me draw a quick profile of the New York City kids I've taught in recent years. It applies to rich kids as well as poor ones, although prosperous kids are better able to cover up these things. The children I teach are indifferent to the adult world. They are hardly curious at all about what grown-up people really do. The children I teach, in fact, 
have little curiosity about anything. They can't even concentrate for very long on activities of their own choice. The children I teach have a poor sense of the future, of how today is connected to tomorrow. They live in a continuous present, the exact moment they are in being the boundary of their consciousness. The children I teach have an equally poor sympathy with the past, with no apparent understanding of how the past created their present, their values, their surroundings, and limited their choices. The children I teach are cruel to each other. They lack compassion for misfortune, even for the misfortune of their own friends. They laugh at weakness. They have contempt for people who need help. The children I teach are uneasy with intimacy or candor. The outer personality they develop is borrowed from television shows and other superficial fashions. It was not earned by commitments or by time spent alone in the wells of spirit from which all human uniqueness derives, I think. My children are imitations, their personalities fabricated from artificial bits and pieces of actors pretending to be somebody that they are not. This patchwork disguise is used as a face to present to the world and to manipulate teachers and adults, but the secret inner self remains poorly formed, incomplete, inadequate to the common stresses of daily living. Because these children are not who they represent themselves to be, the disguise wears thin in the presence of intimacy. So intimate relationships have to be avoided or terminated quickly when they happen. It's not an accident that in Manhattan, 72% of all marriages end less than five years after they were formed. They don't like their own parents very much and they don't really have any close friends. They learn to prefer imitation friendships in the form of people they can hang out with. In that way, they avoid the obligations of truthfulness that intimacy imposes. The children I teach are strikingly materialistic. They follow, I think, the lead of school teachers who materialistically grade everything and TV shows which offer everything in the world for sale. When everything has a price, nothing can be priceless by definition. The children I teach are desperately dependent. They really don't know how to do anything at all. They will probably reach adulthood unable to participate as workers, as citizens, or as effective persons in marriage, parenthood, or community relationships. In the main body of our talk tonight, I'm going to confess to having a hand in making my kids into the strange creatures I've just described. But let me tell you a little bit more about where I come from first, so that when it comes time to confess that as the New York State Teacher of the Year for 1991, I think that the net result of my teaching may be to hurt children. You'll understand how I came to feel that way. My own perspective on life was shaped a long way from New York City in the river town of Monongahela, Pennsylvania. That's a town you've heard of too, although you're not aware of it. Joe Montana came from Monongahela and everyone's heard of him. Monongahela is 40 miles south of Pittsburgh. Even though I later went to Cornell University in Columbia, Monongahela was my school. It was a place of coal mines and steel mills when I was growing up, of paddle wheel steamers. They still had those old river boats with the paddle wheels that you sometimes see in movies. And everyone in town ran to the river if they were free to watch the boats go by, even though the boats went by every day. It was a place of respect for hard work and family life, a place where the smallest parts of daily living had real importance. What was playing at the Bentley movie, what the special was for lunch that day at Peter's restaurant, that was the only restaurant in town and I think still is. Whether it was true that Bill Pulaski's store really had a pen that wrote underwater. Monongahela was a place of muted class distinctions because everyone there was more or less poor, although I don't think any of us knew we were poor. We were all 
in the same boat as everybody else, and schools mixed everyone indiscriminately together. There were no gifted and talented classes and gifted and talented classes and SB classes and regular classes and special ed. Everybody was mixed together. Monongahela was a place where independence, grit, and self-reliance were honored and a place where pride in ethnic culture and local culture was very intense. It was an altogether wonderful place to grow up, even to grow up poor. People talked to each other there about each other instead of minding the abstract business of the world. If you worked in Monongahela, you lived in Monongahela. The spectacle of carpetbaggers from out of state teaching in its schools as such people overrun the schools in Manhattan where I teach would have angered the people of Monongahela and I don't think they would have stood still for it. When you worked in Monongahela, you lived in Monongahela. Indeed, the larger world hardly extended beyond the powerful steel city of Pittsburgh and the movement of those paddle wheel boats up and down the river. Nobody I ever knew felt confined by Monongahela. Nobody within my earshot ever lingered on the possibility they were missing something important by being there and not elsewhere. Harry Taylor Zimmer, my grandfather, had been the town printer since 1898, and that's what the sign above his shop read. He turned away business if he didn't like you or if he had something better to do. I learned more than I can tell you from the school of my grandfather and his independent German ways, things I would have missed if I had grown up in a time like today when old people are put away or kept out of sight. Living in Manhattan has been for me like living on the moon, even though I've been there now for 35 years. My heart and my habits are still from Monongahela. Nevertheless, the shock of Manhattan's very different kind of society and values sharpened my senses and made me an anthropologist as a school teacher. Over the past 26 years, I've used my classes as a laboratory where I could learn the whole broad range of human possibility the whole catalog of our common hopes and fears. And I've also used my classroom as a place where I could study what releases and what inhibits human power. Over the 26 years, I came to believe that genius is an exceedingly common human quality, probably natural to most of us. People want to learn everything unless they get discouraged early, as most schools are set up to discourage them. I began as an elitist, not wanting to believe that at all, so my change of heart did not come easily. But over the years, I saw enough flashes of genius from the unlikeliest human sources that I began to wonder if it was just barely possible that being in school all by itself was what was dumbing them down. Was it possible I had been hired not to enlarge children's power, but to diminish it. That seemed crazy, but slowly I came to realize that bells, confinement, insane sequencing, age segregation, lack of privacy, constant surveillance, and all the rest of the national curriculum of government schooling was designed exactly if somebody had set out to prevent children from learning how to think and how to act to coax them into addictive and dependent behavior. <laughs> bit by bit, I began to devise guerrilla exercises to allow the kids I taught access to raw materials people have always used to educate themselves. Free choice, private time, a relief from constant surveillance and judgments, a pat on the back, help when it was asked for, and as broad a range of human associations as my limited power and resources could manage. I tried to get kids into positions where they would have a chance to be their own teachers, to make themselves the major text of educational worth to be studied. Know yourself first, or you won't ever have a self you can rely on. Every school I was ever in hated those guerrilla exercises of mine and tried to forbid them. 
In theoretical terms, the idea I began to explore was this one. The teaching isn't an art like painting at all. An art where by adding material to a surface, you get an image. But it was much more an art like stone sculpture, where the subtraction of material releases an image already locked in the stone. You get the useless material out of the way of the image, and it produces itself. Sculptor, not painting. The distinction is an important one. In other words, I dropped the idea that I was an expert, bent on filling little heads with my Ivy League expertise, and began to experiment with ways to remove obstacles, preventing the inherent power of my children from gathering and focusing. I no longer felt comfortable defining my work as teaching things they need to know to a struggling captive classroom audience. There wasn't any class at all in reality, only individuals being shoehorned into one ugly boot that fit no one. The logic of compulsory government schooling is such that a premise like the one I just offered you jeopardizes the total institution because if it spread very far, schooling as we know it would collapse. And any form of education that might change the nature of the human product schools now turn out, the psychopathic profile I described at the beginning of this talk is a serious threat to every other institution in our society. All institutions have been shaped to deal with well-schooled people, and all of them would be drastically changed if the number of educated, not schooled, but educated people increased sharply. What social form about us could survive a generation of young people trained to think critically, trained to love and trust themselves, trained to value family, value nature, value friends and neighborhoods as the central treasures of a good life? After years of wrestling with obstacles that stand between children and education, I've come to believe that government monopoly schools, compulsion and all, are structurally unreformable. They cannot function if their central myths are abandoned. No amount of tinkering will correct what is wrong. They cannot function unless their clientele is forced to accept their services. They cannot function unless they tightly control the teacher supply through an exclusive licensing arrangement with teacher training institutions. Thank you. Thank you. Exeter and Andover can function without licensed teachers, it seems. But my school cannot. No, tinkering won't work. Government monopoly schools are corrupt like a rotten pear, they have lost integrity and cannot be made whole. If we want a different pear, we'll have to grow a new one. Over the years, I came to see that whatever I thought I was doing as a teacher, most of what I actually did was to teach an invisible curriculum that made the myths of the school institution and the myths of an economic system based on caste come true. When I was trying to decide what to say to you that might make my experience as a school teacher useful, it occurred to me I could best serve by saying precisely what it is that I do wrong rather than what I do right. What I do right is simple. I get out of kids' way. I give them space and time and respect and a helping hand if I'm asked for it. What I do that is wrong, though, is strange, complex, and frightening. Every government-certified school teacher does it, too. Let me begin to show you what that is. Call me Mr. Gatto, please. The license I hold certifies that I'm an instructor of English language and English literature, but that isn't what I do at all. I don't teach English, I teach school, and I win awards doing it. <laughs> Teaching means different things in different places, but seven lessons are universally taught from Harlem to Hollywood Hills. They constitute a national curriculum you pay dearly for 
even if you homeschool your own kids. So you might as well know what it is. Believe me when I say I intend no irony in this presentation. These are the things I teach. These are the things the taxpayers pay me to teach. Make of them what you will. A lady named Kathy wrote this to me from Indiana the other day. This is a quote from Kathy. What big ideas are important to little kids, she said. Well, the biggest idea I think they need is what they are learning isn't idiosyncratic, that there is some system to it all, and it's not just raining down on them as they helplessly absorb. That's the task, to understand, to make coherent. Kathy has it wrong. The first lesson I teach is confusion. Everything I teach is out of context. I teach the unrelating of everything. I teach disconnections. I teach too much. The orbiting of planets, the law of large numbers, slavery, adjectives, architectural drawing, dance, gymnasium, choral singing, assemblies, surprise guests, fire drills, computer language, parents' night, staff development days, pull-out programs, guidance with strangers you may never see again, standardized tests, age segregation unlike anything seen in the outside world. What do any of these things have to do with each other? Even in the best schools, an examination of curriculum and its sequences turns up a lack of coherence, full of internal contradictions. Fortunately, the children have no words to define the panic and anger they feel at constant violations of natural order and sequence fobbed off on them as quality and education. The logic of the school mind is that it is better to leave school with a toolkit of superficial jargon derived from economics, sociology, natural science, and so on, than to leave with one genuine enthusiasm. But quality in education entails learning about something in depth. Confusion is thrust upon kids by too many strange adults, each working alone with only the thinnest relationship with each other, pretending to an expertise we do not possess. Meaning, not disconnected facts, is what sane human beings seek. Education is a set of codes for processing raw facts into meaning. Behind the patchwork quilt of school sequence and its obsession with facts and theories, the age-old human search for meaning lies well concealed. This is harder to see in elementary grades, where school experience seems to make better sense, because the good-natured, simple relationships, let's do this and let's do that now, are just assumed to mean something, and the clientele is not yet consciously discerned how little substance is behind the play and pretense. Think of all the great natural sequences like learning to walk and learning to talk, following the progression of light from sunrise to sunset, witnessing the ancient procedures of a farm, a smithy, or a shoemaker, watching your mother prepare a Thanksgiving feast, all the parts in perfect harmony, each action justifying itself, illuminating past and future. School sequences aren't like that, not inside a single class and not among the total menu of daily classes. The sequence of my own working day makes some sense but the student sequences are crazy. There is no particular reason for any of them, nothing that bears close scrutiny. Few teachers would dare to teach the tools with which dogmas of a school or a teacher could be criticized even if they knew them, since everything must be accepted. School subjects are learned if they can be learned, like children learn catechism or memorize the 39 articles of Anglicanism. I teach the unrelating of everything, an infinite fragmentation, the opposite of cohesion. What I do is more related to television programming than to making a scheme of order. In a world where home is only a ghost because both parents work or because too many moves or too many job changes or too much ambition or something else has left everybody too confused to stay in a family relation, 
I teach you how to accept confusion as your destiny. That's the first lesson I teach. The second lesson I teach is your class position. I teach that you must stay in the class where you belong. I don't know who decides my kids belong there, but that's not my business. The children are numbered so that if any get away, they can be returned to the right class. Over the years, the variety of ways children are numbered by schools has increased dramatically until it is hard to see the human being plainly under the weight of the numbers he carries. Numbering children is a big and very profitable undertaking, though what the strategy is designed to accomplish is elusive. It's so damaging, I don't even know why parents would allow it to be done to their kid without a fight. In any case, that's not my business. My job is to make them like being locked in together with children who bear numbers like their own, or at the least to endure it like good sports. If I do my job well, the kids can't even imagine themselves somewhere else because I've shown them how to envy and fear better classes and how to have contempt for dumb classes. Under this efficient discipline, my group mostly polices itself into good marching order. That's the real lesson of any rigged competition like school. You come to know your place. In spite of an overall class blueprint which assumes 99% of the kids are in their class to stay, I nevertheless make a public effort to exhort children to higher levels of test success, hinting at an eventual transfer from the lower class as a reward. I frequently insinuate the day will come when an employer will hire them on the basis of test scores and grades, even though my own experience is that employers are rightly indifferent to such things. I never lie outright, but I've come to see that truth and school teaching are at bottom incompatible, just as Socrates said they were thousands of years ago. The lesson of numbered classes is that everyone has a proper place in the Egyptian pyramid and that there is no way out of your class except by number magic. Unless that happens, you must stay where you were put. The third lesson I teach is indifference. I teach children not to care about anything too much, even though they should make it appear that they do. How I do this is very subtle. I do it by demanding they become totally involved in my lessons, jumping up and down in their seats with anticipation, competing vigorously with each other for my favor. It's heartwarming when they do that. It impresses everyone, even me. When I'm at my best, I plan lessons very carefully in order to produce this show of enthusiasm. But when the bell rings, I insist everyone drop whatever it is we have been doing and proceed quickly to the next workstation. They must turn on and off like light switches. Nothing important is ever finished in my class, nor in any class I know of. Students never have a complete experience, except on the installment plan. Indeed, the lesson of bells is that no work is worth finishing. So why care too deeply about anything? Years of bells will condition all but the very strongest to a world that can no longer offer much important work to do. Bells are the secret logic of school time. Their argument is inexorable. Bells destroy the past and future, converting every interval into a sameness as an abstract map makes every living mountain and river look the same, though your own eyes and ears and feelings tell you that no two mountains or two rivers are the same. Bells inoculate each undertaking with indifference. The fourth lesson I teach is emotional dependency. By stars and red checks, smiles and frowns, prizes, honors and disgraces, I teach you to surrender your will, that's a good omen, to the predestinated chain of command. Rights may be granted or withheld by any authority without appeal because rights do not exist inside a school, especially the right of free speech, which the Supreme Court very recently ruled does not exist inside schools unless school authorities say it does. 
As a school teacher, I intervene in many personal decisions, issuing a pass for those I deem legitimate or initiating a disciplinary confrontation for behavior that threatens my control. Individuality is constantly trying to assert itself among children and teenagers, so my judgments come thick and fast. Individuality is a contradiction of class theory, a curse to all systems of classification. Here are some common ways it shows up. Children sneak away for a private minute in the toilet on the pretext of moving their bowels. They trick me out of a private instant in the hallway on the grounds they need water. I know they don't, of course, but I often allow them to deceive me because this conditions them to depend on my favors. Sometimes free will appears right in front of me in pockets of children, angry, depressed, or happy about things outside my understanding. Rights in such matters cannot be recognized, only privileges which can be withdrawn. The fifth lesson I teach is intellectual dependency. Good people wait for a teacher to tell them what to do. It is the most important lesson that we must wait for other people better trained than ourselves to make the meanings of our lives. The expert makes all the important choices. Only I can determine what you must study, or rather, only the people who pay me can make those decisions, which I enforce. If I'm told that evolution is a fact instead of a theory, I transmit that as ordered. Punishing deviants who resist what I've been told to have them think. This power to control what children will think lets me separate successful students from failures very easily. Successful children do whatever I tell them to do. With a minimum of resistance and a decent show of enthusiasm, of the millions of things of value to study, I decide what few we have time for, or it is decided by my faceless employer. The choices are his. Why should I argue? Curiosity has no place in my work, only conformity. Bad kids fight this, of course even though they lack the concepts to know what they are fighting, struggling to make decisions for themselves about what they will learn and when they will learn it. Fortunately, there are tested procedures to break the will of those who resist. It is more difficult, naturally, if the kid has respectable parents who come to his aid, but that happens less and less in spite of the bad reputation of schools. Nobody middle class I ever met actually believes that their kid's school is one of the bad ones. And I'd like to tell you something. I was on the McNeil-Lair report about three months ago, and sitting next to me was the ex-governor of New Jersey, Tom Kane, who thought he was going to be the next Secretary of Education. And after the show was over, we started talking. And he said, you know, the most difficult thing in trying to reform education in New Jersey when I was governor was so wherever I went, people would say, you've got to do something about those bad schools. And he would say, but what about this one? And they said, oh, no, not my school. It's not a bad one. So not a single parent in 26 years of teaching ever thought their kid was in a bad school, even though the schools that I teach in, the district between Columbia University and Lincoln Center, is the lowest rated school district in New York State out of 734. That's amazing and probably the best testimony to what happens to families when mother and father have been well schooled themselves, learning the seven lessons I'm teaching you. Good people wait for an expert to tell them what to do. It is hardly an exaggeration to say that our entire economy depends upon this lesson being learned. Think of what might fall apart if children weren't trained to be dependent. The social service businesses could hardly survive. They would vanish, I think, into the recent historical limbo out of which they arose. Counselors and therapists would look on in horror as the supply of psychic invalids dwindled. Commercial entertainment of all sorts, including television, would wither as people learned again how to make their own fun. Restaurants, prepared food packagers, and a whole host of other assorted food services would be drastically downsized if people returned to
to making their own meals rather than depending on strangers to plant, pick, chop, season, and cook for them. Much of modern law, medicine, and engineering would go to the clothing business and school teaching as well, unless a guaranteed supply of helpless people poured out of our schools each year. We build a way of life that depends on people doing what they're told because they don't know how to tell themselves what to do. It's one of the biggest lessons I teach. The sixth lesson I teach is provisional self-esteem. If you've ever tried to wrestle a kid into line whose parents have convinced him they love him in spite of anything, you know how impossible it is to make self-confident people conform. Our world wouldn't survive a flood of confident people very long, so I teach that your self-respect should depend on expert opinion. My kids are constantly evaluated and judged. A monthly report is sent into student homes to signal my approval or mark exactly down to a single percentage point how dissatisfied parents should be. The ecology of good schooling depends on perpetuating dissatisfaction just as much, I'm afraid, as our commercial economy depends on the same fertilizer. Although some people might be surprised how little time or reflection goes into making up these precise mathematical records, the cumulative weight of the documents establishes a profile of defect compelling a child to arrive at certain decisions about himself and his future based on the casual judgment of strangers. Self-evaluation, the staple of every major philosophical system that ever appeared on this planet, is never a factor in these things, not in good schools or bad. The lesson of report cards, grades, and tests is that children should not trust themselves or their parents but need to rely on the evaluation of certified officials. People must be told what they are worth. The seventh lesson I teach is that you can't hide. I teach children they are always watched by keeping each student under constant surveillance, as do my colleagues. There are no private spaces for children. There is no private time. Class change lasts 300 seconds to keep promiscuous fraternization at low levels. Let me tell you where I got that expression, promiscuous fraternization. I sat in Boston li libraries for three years reading the minutes of the Boston School Committee. That's the group headed by Horace Mann that gave Washington and Oregon and every other state the kind of compulsory schools we have. They met in secret for 20 years and they left behind the minutes of every word they said. What they didn't do was assign statements to individual speakers, but these piles of paper are there for every one of you to read. In 20 years of planning the kind of schools that we have now, the word education doesn't occur once, not once. But what does occur frequently is this expression, promiscuous fraternization. First, the kids have to be taken away from their parents because parents are promiscuously affectionate. Yes, and provide a sanctuary which very well may run counter to the will of the state authority. And then, of course, they must be prevented from promiscuously fraternizing with each other. So that expression comes from the minutes of the Boston School Committee circa 1845 when they finally decided that the waves of Irish immigration which they knew were about to take place not because of the potato famine but because they had cornered the free land in the West which in those days was Ohio and Indiana and Michigan and even upstate New York and without people on that land the land was worthless so the decision was made to bring in millions of immigrants to settle that land and buy their clothing and their food and their professional services from the classes in charge. Well, that's another, that's another talk. Students are encouraged to tattle on each other or even to tattle on their own parents. 
Of course, I encourage parents to file reports about their own child's waywardness, too. A family trained to snitch on each other isn't likely to conceal any dangerous secrets. I assign a type of extended schooling called homework, too, so that my surveillance travels into private households where students might otherwise use free time to learn something unauthorized from a father or mother by exploration or by apprenticing. <laughs> Let me tell you where I got that idea, because I'm not smart enough to come up with these things myself. In 1650, a book was written, published in Boston, and circulated to the elite of Boston called Spiritual Milk for Boston Babes. Now, even though it was 200 years in advance of compulsory schooling, what it advocated very strongly was that for the state to be strong, there would have to be compulsory schooling that split parents away from their children, for, and then, and then, when the children did go home to their parents, John Cotton, that was Cotton Mather's uncle, I believe, invented homework, he said, because that way we'll keep them from fraternizing with their parents. Disloyalty to the idea of schooling is a devil always ready to find work for idle hands. The meaning of constant surveillance and denial of privacy is that no one can be trusted, that privacy is not legitimate. Surveillance is an ancient urgency among certain influential thinkers. It is a central prescription set down in Plato's Republic, book five of which lays down the blueprint for compulsory schooling and once again gives its logic as the necessity, the utter necessity of separating children from their own parents. Uh, in, it's in St. Augustine's City of God, in John Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion. All of these major texts of Western thought say that kids have to be kept under constant surveillance. It's in Francis Bacon's New Atlantis, in Hobbes' Leviathan, and many other places. Now, in the years I was doing research on, on a book that's probably a year away from coming out, I discovered that most of the major thinkers in the Western world have been not only men, which we all know, but childless men. All these childless men who wrote these books discovered the same thing. Children must be closely watched. Children will follow a private drummer if you can't get them into a uniformed marching band. It is the great triumph of compulsory government monopoly mass schooling that even among the best of my fellow teachers and even among the best of my students' parents, only a small number can imagine a different way to do things. The imagination that all of you here have. The kids have to know how to read and write, don't they? They have to know how to add and subtract, don't they? They have to learn to follow orders if they ever expect to keep a job. Only a few lifetimes ago, things were very different in the United States. Originality and variety were common currency. Our freedom from regimentation made us the miracle of the world. Social class boundaries were relatively easy to cross. Our citizenry was marvelously confident inventive, and able to do many things independently. We were something, we Americans, all by ourselves, without government sticking its nose into our lives, without institutions and social agencies telling us how to think and feel. No, all by ourselves we were something, as individuals. We've had a society under central control in the U.S since just before the Civil War. And such a society requires compulsory schooling, government monopoly schooling, to maintain itself. Before the society changed, schooling wasn't very important anywhere, not anywhere in the world, not in any country. We had it, but not too much of it, and only as much as an individual wanted. People learned to read, write, and do arithmetic just fine anyway, and if you think that's an emotional statement, I'm about to prove at least part of it. There are some recent studies which show literacy at the time of the American Revolution as close to total. 
Tom Paine's Common Sense, a book that's now seldom seen outside of college graduate schools, sold 600,000 copies to a population of two and a half million people, 20% of whom were African slaves and 50% of whom were European slaves called indentures where the master had the power of life and death. And to that certainly difficult audience, at least by modern lights, one person out of every four bought a book. Unless you think they bought the book for coffee tables, they bought the book to read. That would be comparable to a book in 1990 selling 65 million copies. Were our ancestors all geniuses? No, the truth is that reading, writing, and arithmetic only take about 100 hours to transmit as long as the audience is eager and willing to learn. The trick is to wait until someone asks and then move fast while the urge is upon him. <laughs> You know, I must, I must tell you something funny, because I can barely add and subtract myself, but there's, there's a famous school near Boston called the Sudbury Valley School. I don't know if any of you have heard of it. Someone has heard of the Sudbury Valley School. And the, the, one of the directors, the founder of this school is a, a friend of mine, Dan Greenberg. He was a full professor of physics at Columbia University, and he was on the admissions committee of Barnard College, one of those snotty girls schools. Uh, Dan opened his school 24 years ago and he said, I knew that reading was very, very easy to teach because you don't teach it. People learn it and both my kids learned it by themselves. Although the girl didn't learn it until she was 11. He said by the time she was 13, she was reading 20 or 30 books a month and you couldn't have told that she didn't read in the cradle. But he said, mathematics, he said, that's where my own status was wrapped up. I knew that the math curriculum was going to be tough to do the same way. He said, so it was with horror that I realized after about the sixth year they had Sudbury open that it takes 20 hours, he said, to do the whole math curriculum. And he, sometimes it takes a couple hours more and sometimes a couple hours less. He said, but basically the trick's the same. You wait until the mood's on somebody and then you hurry up. <laughs> Millions of people teach themselves these things. It really isn't very hard to do. Pick up a fifth grade textbook in math or rhetoric from 1840 and you'll see that the texts were pitched then on what would be advanced college level today. The continuing cry for basic skills practice is a smokescreen behind which schools preempt the time of children for 12 years and teach them the seven lessons I've just taught you. They call that socialization. We've had a society increasingly under central control in the United States since just before the Civil War. The lives we lead, the clothes we wear, the food we eat, the green highway signs we drive by from coast to coast are the product of this central control. So too, I think, are the epidemics of drugs, suicide, divorce, violence, cruelty, and the hardening of class into caste in the U.S. products of the dehumanization of our lives, the lessening of individual and family importance that central control imposes. The character of large compulsory institutions is inevitable. They always want more time, more money, more control until there isn't anything left to take. School removes our children from any possibility of an active role in community life. It destroys communities by reserving the training of children to certified experts. And by doing so, it ensures our children cannot grow up fully human. Aristotle taught, and I'm citing the politics for those of you out there who are philosophers, 
that without a fully active role in community life, you could not hope to be a real human being. Surely he was right. Look around you the next time you are near a school or an old age reservation. That will be the evidence he is right. No one in those places is allowed to be real. School as it was built is an essential support system for a vision of social engineering that condemns most people to be subordinate stones in a pyramid that narrows as it ascends to its control terminal. School is an artifice which makes such a pyramidal social order seem inevitable, although such a premise is a fundamental betrayal of the American Revolution. In colonial days, right through the period of the early republic, we had no schools to speak of. Read Benjamin Franklin's autobiography for a man who had no time to waste in school. And yet the promise of democracy was beginning to be realized here. We turned our backs on this promise by bringing to life the ancient dream of Egypt, compulsory subordination for all. That was the secret that Plato reluctantly transmitted in the Republic when Glaucon and Adamantus transmitted, excuse me, Glaucon and Adamantus extorted from Socrates the plan for total state control of human life that would be necessary to maintain a society where some people took more than their share. I will show you, said Socrates, how to bring about such a feverish city, but you will not like what I am going to say. And so the blueprint of the seven lesson school was first sketched. The current debate about whether we should have a national curriculum is phony. We already have a national curriculum locked up in these seven lessons and a few more I decided to spare you. Such a curriculum produces physical, moral, and intellectual paralysis and no curriculum of content will be sufficient to reverse its hideous effects. What is currently under discussion in our national school hysteria about failing academic performance is a great irrelevancy that misses the point. Schools teach exactly what they are intended to teach and they do it very, very well. How to be a good Egyptian and where your place is in the pyramid. Just a little more and then I'll issue some bathroom passes. <laughs> None of this is inevitable, you know. None of it is impossible to overthrow. We do have choice in how we bring up young people and there is no one right way. If we broke the power of Egyptian illusion, we would see that. I'm going to say something that's very controversial. Don't throw things at me. I gave this section to the Board of Directors of United Technologies in Connecticut last week, and there was an absolutely deadly silence when I was done. There is no life or death international competition threatening our national existence. Difficult as that idea is even to think about, let alone believe, in the face of a continual media barrage of myth to the contrary. In every important material respect, our nation is self-sufficient in energy, in fiber, in food, in metals, in manpower. I realize that idea runs counter to the most fashionable thinking of political economists, but the quote profound transformation of our economy these people talk about is neither inevitable nor irreversible. Global economics does not speak to the public need for jobs affordable homes, adequate schools and medical care, a clean environment, honest and accountable government, social and cultural renewal, or simple justice. All global ambitions are based on a definition of productivity and the good life so alienated from common human reality that I am convinced it is wrong and that most people would agree if they had a choice. We might be able to see that if we regained a hold on a philosophy that locates meaning where meaning genuinely is to be found in families, in friends, in the passage of seasons, in nature, in simple ceremonies and rituals, in curiosity, generosity, compassion, 
and service to others in a decent independence and privacy in all the free and inexpensive things out of which real families, real friends, and real communities are built, then we would be so self-sufficient we would not even need our own material sufficiency. How did these awful places, these schools, come about? Well, casual schooling has always been with us in a variety of forms, a mildly useful adjunct to growing up. But total schooling as we know it is a byproduct of the two red scares of 1848 and 1919 when powerful interests feared a revolution among our own industrial poor. Partly, too, total schooling came about because old line Eastern American families were revolted by the home cultures of Celtic, Slavic, and Latin immigrants after 1845 and revolted by the Catholic religion they brought with them. Certainly a third contributing cause to making a jail for children called school must be located in the prospect with which these same families regarded the movement of Africans through the society in the wake of the Civil War. Look again at the seven lessons of school teaching. Confusion, class assignment, dulled response, emotional and intellectual dependency, conditional self-esteem, surveillance, all of these things are good training for permanent underclasses. People deprived forever of finding the center of their own special genius. And in later years, it became training shaken loose from even its own original logic, which was to regulate the poor. In the 1920s, the growth of the school bureaucracy and the less visible growth of a horde of industries that profit from schooling just exactly as it is enlarged this institution's original grasp to where it began to seize the sons and daughters of the great middle classes. Is it any wonder Socrates was outraged at the accusation he took money to teach? My reference there is the apology when he's on trial for his life. And the only time that he's known in print ever to have gotten angry, to lose his temper, is when someone accused him of taking money for teaching. Then he just blew up and he said, look, I can take anything. You can have my life, but I won't accept that. Uh, and, and the reason, of course, the, the reason, of course, is the temptation is inevitable to take that 30 hours of teaching reading and that 20 or 40 hours of teaching mathematics and, and writing and enlarge it and enlarge it and reserve the secrets to yourself and then finally to get the government to guarantee you a clientele. Even then, philosophers saw the inevitable direction the professionalization of teaching would take, preempting the teaching function that belongs to everybody in a healthy community. That's why I told you the story of Monongahela, because in Monongahela, everybody was a teacher. The railroad brakeman, and even the bums on the street. Well, there was only one, but he was a teacher too. Professional teaching tends to another serious air. It makes things inherently easy to learn, reading, writing, and arithmetic seem difficult by insisting they be taught through pedagogical procedures. With lessons like the ones I teach every day, it should be little wonder that we have a national crisis, the nature of the one we have. Young people indifferent to the adult world and to the future, indifferent to almost anything except the diversion of toys and violence. Rich or poor, school children who face the 21st century cannot concentrate on anything for very long. They have a poor sense of time past and time to come. They're mistrustful of intimacy. They hate solitude. They're cruel, materialistic, dependent, passive, violent, timid in the face of the unexpected, addicted to distraction. All the peripheral tendencies of childhood are nourished and magnified to a grotesque extent by schooling, which prevents effective personality development by its hidden curriculum. 
No common school that actually dared to teach the use of critical thinking tools like the dialectic, the heuristic, or other devices that free minds should employ would last very long without being torn to pieces. School has become the replacement for church in our secular society, and like church, its teachings must be taken on faith. It is time that we face the fact squarely that institutional school teaching is destructive to children. Its method is deeply and profoundly anti-educational. No tinkering will fix it. In one of the great ironies of human affairs, the massive reworking schooling requires would cost so much less than we are spending now that powerful interests cannot afford to let it happen. You must understand that first and foremost, the business I am in is a jobs project and an agency for letting contracts. We cannot afford to save money by reducing the scope of our operation or by diversifying the product we offer, even if it helps children grow upright. That is the iron law of institutional schooling. It is a business, neither subject to normal accounting procedures or to the rational scalpel of competition. Some form of free market system in public schooling is the likeliest place to look for answers. A free market where home schools and neighborhood schools and small entrepreneurial schools and religious schools and craft schools and farm schools exist in profusion to compete with government education. And I want to tell you something hopeful. Now I'm going to knock on wood not to jinx it. I know that Oregon voted down uh, a bill to release some of the tax monies recently. But what I've recently found out is that the state of Delaware is about to put an initiative on its ballot to surrender to any parent who chooses any alternative other than government schools the median uh, tuition of a Delaware private school. And the backer of that bill is a man named Pierre DuPont. Now, I, I don't know if the name DuPont in, in the state of Washington means much, but I can tell you in the state of Delaware, it means almost everything. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to describe a free market in schooling just exactly like the one the country had right up to the Civil War one in which students volunteer for the kind of education that suits them, even if that means self-education. That didn't hurt Benjamin Franklin that I can see. These options, by the way, I can tell you another fact that nobody wants to face. In spite of the, the heavy load that we've put on the backs of uh, American school dropouts, the Wall Street Journal last month reported in a tiny squib that one out of every 15 American millionaires is a school dropout. <laughs> that includes Lear, who invented the Lear jet, and, and Ray Kroc, who invented the McDonald's hamburger, and a lot of other people. These options exist now in miniature, wonderful survivals of a strong and vigorous past, but they are available only to the resourceful, the courageous, that's you guys, the lucky or the rich. The near impossibility of one of these better roads opening for the shattered families of the poor or for the bewildered host camped on the fringes of the urban middle class foretells the disaster of seven lesson schools is going to grow unless we do something bold and decisive with the massive government monopoly schooling. After an adult lifetime spent teaching school, I believe the method of maths, math schooling is the only real content it has. Don't be fooled into thinking that good curriculum or good equipment or good teachers are the critical determinants of school time. All the pathologies we've considered come about in large measure because the lessons of school prevent children from keeping important appointments with themselves and with their families to learn lessons in self-motivation, perseverance, self-reliance, courage, dignity, and love, and lessons in service to others too, which are among the key lessons of home life. 
30 years ago, these... <laughs> 30 years ago, these things could still be learned in the time left after school. But television has eaten up most of that time. And a combination, combination of television and the stresses peculiar to two-income families or single-parent ones have swallowed up most of what used to be family time as well. Our kids have no time left to grow up fully human and only thin soil wastelands to do it in. A future is rushing down upon our culture which will insist all of us learn the wisdom of non-material experience. A future which will demand as the price of survival that we follow a pace of natural life, economical and material cost. These lessons cannot be learned in schools as they are. School is like starting life with a 12-year jail sentence where bad habits are the only curriculum truly learned. I teach school and win awards doing it. I should know. Congratulations to you all for not learning these seven lessons and welcome to the sixth annual Washington Homeschool Convention. <laughs>